records a session. Um, first of all, we need someone, one person or two persons that would be willing to make notes for the minutes. Uh, like last time, we would create minutes for the session, uh, which we would like to share to the community as well. So we need someone or two persons voluntary for making notes and probably help us to write the minutes. So who can help this? Is, it's not about writing the minutes itself. Um, this is something Ben Norn and I can do, but uh, obviously we need some notes uh, about what was said and some detail um, that support our efforts to write the minutes. And I cannot do it in parallel. Because I'm... Yeah, I can do it. Yeah. Thank you, Florian. Okay. So. Then we share the screen here. Okay, so can you see my screen now? This is the case. Okay, perfect. Then again, welcome to the second uh, session of the quality workshop series from the IHFC and the International Leaders Fair program. Um, wait. The goal for today is a bit different compared to what we initially agreed. Now, the initial idea of this workshop was that um, we are discussing about some thematic topics like conductivity, temperature gradient, the heat flow determination, in the light of uh, the quality of the resulting heat flow data. And um, the, last, the last session was quite interesting. I've learned a lot and uh, I think we we had a very intense discussion on the topic of conductivity and uh, a lot of questions were raised but the discussion was a kind of meandering. So the proposal at the end of the last session was that we summarize uh, this discussion in the minutes and um, that we came out with uh, a proposal for a quality scheme in the beginning of this workshop. Um, because my impression was that um, it was the, we, we were missing a target, a goal, a, a common goal at this point. Um, and that was the reason why the discussion was meandering somewhere around. It was difficult to focus it. So um, the proposal for today, and I'm uh, at this point uh, very sorry that I missed to send an agenda around before. So Lazi reminded me, but um, I simply forgot to attach the agenda. For today would be the top two that uh, we summarize the workshop results from last time. And then we came out with a proposal of a potential quality scheme. Um, which we would like to discuss with you and based on this proposal and um, we can go into depth on conductivity, temperature and heat flow in follow up workshops. Uh, if we have a general agreement about the idea, I think uh, that helps a bit to focus the, the overall discussion. Um, yeah, Probably because as a news point, uh, this is just a reminder, some of you may know uh, others may not. Uh, for that reason, uh, the news here is that uh, next week uh, there will be the Global Heat Flow Day, which will be a live support session on how to convert recent heat flow values into the new database structure. Um, this is something we can talk about probably later if some of you are not informed. Uh, so this is just first news here for today. Okay, synthesis of the last meeting, the most important. Uh, I learned this was a very intense discussion. Uh, uh, there was a lot of, I think, important contributions, reminders, uh, uh, things that has been discussed. A lot of questions has been raised on the importance of different aspects of conductivity. Um, this is uh, as, as far as possible documented in the minutes from last time. Uh, I can share the link uh, in the following again. Um, but it became clear that um, 
there are so a lot of um, different aspects on view on the topic that it was not that easy to focus the discussion. Um, there are some key points here. So we discussed, uh, Ilmo raised, for example, that uh, we should consider again the handbook of feed food determination. Um, many questions has been raised uh, about the importance of different aspects of conductivity. And um, yeah, our feeling was if we have the same discussion for temperature and for a heat flow workshop as well, um, it would be difficult to, to develop something out of it because we were circulating again and again last time uh, um, around uh, different questions uh, and different points of views um, without getting some, um, yeah, uh, getting into one direction. So this is this direction is something we we hope that we can achieve today, right? And um, probably just to to open up this discussion, and um, um, I would like just to have this view on what we are talking about, right? Uh, we are talking about conductivity and uh, temperature gradients measurements that uh, are used for heat flow calculations, right? and. Um, Obviously, those gradients uh, could be perturbed by some side effects or terrain effects, and uh, we know the methods to correct those temperature gradients and to come up with heat for calculations that have some kind of corrections for side effects. And um, um, obviously, to those heat flow calculations, um, uncertainties are associated. So we more or less uh, talking about a triplet of methods of perturbations and uncertainties that are relevant when we are talking about quality. Yeah. Um, so if you think about a quality scheme, um, we need to consider uh, this triplet of information. Yeah. And the idea basically is that we want to evaluate terrestrial heat flow. And, um, for those uh, evaluation, we need to consider those three aspects, I think. And um, our proposal directly is simply that um, we think about a quality scheme that considers those three aspects independently of each other. First of all, we can of obviously calculate an uh, uh, uncertainty uh, um, of a heat flow value. So to quantify errors here in a numerical way, this is one aspect. But um, if we do this, it's say nothing about robustness of methods, say nothing about whether perturbation effects take place. So um, we should also add a methodological quality check, uh, whether the scientific methods used to compute conductivity and to compute the temperature gradients are robust, are reliable. Uh, if we just would focus on methods, uh, it would, would not be possible to quantify errors or to, it wouldn't say nothing about whether the site is perturbed by effects. So the, th the third aspect we think we should include are the perturbation effects and, and all three aspects uh, should go into uh, a common quality scheme. Uh, and that is what I would like to introduce, um, the idea, idea we have on that. And um, if, you have, if you have questions for immediately understanding, just, just raise your questions, uh, interrupt. If there are general questions for discussion, I would ask you probably write it into the chat if, or keep it in mind. Um, that we can focus on, on the presentation first and then on the discussion afterwards. Um, I would like to go to those three steps of, uh, of the quality scheme we propose uh, now slide by slide. Um, in the final end, we would like to introduce a combined quality score. Uh, and this quality score can look like uh, this gray uh, artificial number here. This is a proposal, but you will immediately understand how to read it. Uh, and if you read it and uh, you understand how this works, it will allow everyone immediately to, to compare heat flow data in terms of those three aspects of uncertainty, methods, and perturbations. 
first of all, uncertainty quantification obviously uh, is a numerical quantification, uh, which based on um, or could based on the error propagation um, um, from conductivity and temperature gradients and the sample size itself. Uh, we think that those uh, quantifications should be applied on the child level uh, um, and can be applied to, to any kind of, of child values uh, with any kind of status, obviously. Um, it is combined of two aspects. Uh, the first one for the error propagation, um, um, we could use the coefficient of variation uh, of uh, the heat flow values. Uh, the coefficient of variation is defined here as a one sigma divided by the mean. So this is a relative uh, uh, error parameter, which has no units and can be given as a percentage value. And uh, so common values could be then clustered probably in categories like smaller 5%, 5 to 10, 10 to 10, 25. So this is a bit, this classification is a bit similar to what we already had. Uh, uh, given the with an error less than 10% is a very good heat flow uh, and, and larger in the past. Um, this coefficient of variation um, and this error message should be combined with the questions, how should we consider the number of conductivity and temperature gradient measurements? And our proposal for that is that we normalize those values and we normalize them in terms of the length of the heat flow interval. So uh, if we take the number of conductivity values here and normalize it compared to the length of the interval for heat flow determination, uh, and we are doing the same uh, for the number of temperature data uh, within this length, uh, we got, let's say, a score. Uh, the score could be expressed, for example, as, as a logarithm of the, the one normalization times the other normalization. Uh, and this gives you a kind of score, um, which you can have in, in the X and Y plot. Uh, and uh, um, this score is then given in logarithmic way, um, which means that uh, with such a score, you consider um, you consider the the pure number of determinations, uh, as well as you put it in relation to the length of the interval, which obviously is important because uh, then measurements, for example, might be interesting for a five meter interval, but not for a five hundred meter interval. So this puts some relations. Uh, and so, or some interconnections here into the system. And um, if you then use both, uh, both values, the coefficient of duration and this score where the pure number and the length is included, you can, let's say, calculate a kind of score, uh, resulting uncertainty score, uh, which means that you define those logarithmic values, that you categorize those logarithmic values within. And um, yeah. Um, put some scheme on it, uh, um, which means that uh, uh, you can read this table here like that you have um, the coefficient operations on, on the one x and obviously the score that depends on the number and the length of the interval on the other x axis and um, obviously this means that if you have very small coefficient operations, uh, you even can have uh, a pure uncertainty quantification if this is based on very very few values in very large uh, intervals. This is, for example, the case uh, here for the smaller five percentage of coefficient of variation, and uh, if you have very small logarithm values uh, based on this analysis. Uh, and on the other hand side, uh, uh, large numbers of uh, um, large numbers of conductivity and temperature gradient values um, can a bit uh, uh, outplay if you have uh, only uh, computed small coefficient of variations. Um, I just asked directly here, is the step from, from, from this idea, putting the numbers of values uh, compared to the lengths to so normalize those values uh, and plot it at once against the others, um, to coming to those uh, uncertainty scores clear for the moment. Uh, 
Okay. Okay, then I would proceed. Yeah, so, sorry, Sven, I have yeah. some more practical questions. So, uh, in a, when we are applying this kind of approach, we are supposed to, let's say, calculate the score um, numerically and then plot it into the table. How did you figure it out? So then around it, I don't know if it is five, let's say, the ratio that we get for the gradient, then we round it to 10. How, how were you thinking about it? Mm, I, I did not know. fully get the question, sorry. So, so we are calculating the, uh, the score, for example, of the yes. number of conductivity divided by the length, okay? Yes. And then the temperature, uh, number of temperature point divided by the length. And there will be some numbers, they will be not uh, one, ten, no, like it is no. here in the logarithmic scale. Yes. And then we are supposed to calculate the score based on this number. And also we will get not a one to ten number, but we will get some number in between. Yes. Okay. Okay. So how then we go into the scheme, into the yeah. into the table, no? That I, was I, my question. Yes. I would like to to focus your attention on, on this axis here. Um, because the results of your calculations, the, the score, this could then uh, 3.54, right? Uh, that's what, yeah, what I'm yeah. yeah. uh, it, uh -huh. okay. it is categorized here. So for, for all those score values okay. above two, yeah, then you would go into this column and um, okay. put it in relation to the coefficient okay. of variation. Yeah. So practically the first the first figure, it, we have to forget it, let's say. The first. First yeah, scheme, it, it was just, just, yeah, I understand it, now. It's just to, uh, yeah, to show the way how things would proceed here. Yeah. Obviously, um, this is, um, this is the first idea. And this yeah, is yeah. how we try to, to get those information of the number of values uh, compared to the length of the interval and the coefficient of variation together. Huh? Um, obviously, one can talk about those thresholds. One can talk also about those thresholds, whether it makes sense or not. Uh, it's just the basic idea how we could get those information into an uncertainty quantification in the first place. Uh. Sven, a quick question. Have you tested this already with real data? Uh, yes. Quickly, yesterday in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah it's, it, this is... Um, <laughs> um, yeah, th so the coefficient of variation obviously is a very common uh, statistical... Uh, parameter, um, um, but but even that we could discuss. It's just yeah, a proposal how we could target those until certain quantification. And I think the crucial point uh, last time we circulated around uh, the questions how, whether the number of conductivity is important and uh, whether how we could reflect re uh, variability of formation, for example. Uh, and um, so um, this was. Um, yeah, this is simply the first approach, how we could connect all those three points, uh, the variation uh, parameter, the number of measurements and the relation to the total length of the interval we are looking on. Uh, but um, um, if, th if you think the basic proposal is okay, then we could discuss in detail or write afterwards whether we find better statistical means here. Yeah. I find this very reasonable. Okay, so then I would go to the second level here to the to the methods. Okay. Um, the basic idea is that if we are able to quantify uncertainties with with an approach we have proposed in the first step, it say nothing about whether the methods are reliable or not. And for that reason, in the second part, we should have an evaluation of the methodological quality of the conductivity determination and the temperature gradient determination. So we think here again about a score-based qualifications that reflects the accurateness of those methods um, and probably that is related to the technical quality of the measurement itself. And um, yeah, for that, I, I would like to introduce this figure. The basic idea here is um, that we define a scoring scheme um, based on 
um, on some classes with, with scoring values uh, that are associated to, uh, to specific uh, methods. So my idea or our, our idea here was that obviously single point measurements are not uh, that's reliable compared to continuous temperature data. And uh, so step by step uh, from single point temperature measurements up to multiple point temperature measurements and uh, to continuous temperature profiles, oh, sorry, uh, whether they are in thermal equilibrium or not, one can discriminate uh, a, a rank of quality for temperature measurements. Uh, I don't know whether those four classes are sufficient uh, um, or whether one should include more, but it is the first proposal. Uh, and uh, the same, obviously, we can think about thermal conductivity. Um, from literature, obviously, having dry measured uh, values under laboratory conditions um, is nice to have, but um, if we have uh, in situ measured values or uh, saturated uh, samples with uh, that reflect pressure and temperature conditions of the reservoir, uh, we obviously would uh, rank it higher. Uh, uh, so this is what we can do on both axes, uh, on the temperature axis and the conductivity axis. And um, the idea here is that if we combine both uh, scoring values or both values and class values, um, we can um, one can follow the idea that obviously uh, very good conductivity values and very good temperature values should give us the highest score and vice versa a smaller score if the data are not good and that um, um, obviously very good conductivity values with poor temperature data uh, cannot have the highest values. Now, this is obvious. Um, here again, uh, uh, one can um, uh, deal and uh, um, one can adjust those uh, values for each uh, class. One can also adjust the number of classes if we think some more aspects should be considered here. Um, but the general idea is that we have those kind of metrics between conductivity and temperature related methods um, that uh, give us a score, uh, uh, which then we can categorize. Um, in this case, I have categorized this here with, with values shown here, a value range between 0.85, for example, and one means this is the category runs for the one for the methods, which gives us the, the highest uh, methodological reliability. And uh, then step-by-step, step, uh, the quality is reduced uh, as shown here, or it cannot be computed because data are missing or the data are insufficient for, for such an information. Uh, and the overall process could like uh, could look like that you have a data set you want to check and you check whether you have a complete basic data you require for such an analysis and uh, uh, you check whether you have local information used or the methods are known. And if this is not the case, obviously, um, it cannot be evaluated for the methodological scheme. And otherwise, um, um, we can uh, assign different classes of categorization based on the information given here, uh, which then gives you a kind of review data set. Um, this is, and uh, to, to address the questions uh, of Ilmo, <laughs> this is something we, we applied uh, to the overall German data set in the past and um, where we try to uh, get an answer about um, some methodological reliability. So um, it, it basically worked for us uh, with the specific data set, um, but um, we really could open up the discussion whether we should have a, a more refined class classification here, uh, if we should consider other aspects and um, one can also, of course, discuss those values. Yeah? assigned because obviously um, it is a kind of rating here um, um, yeah which we should critically view on whether this works whether we should refine it or uh, treat it in a different way yeah. this would be the proposal for the se second step uh, how we could quantify or qualify the the methods uh, of a heat flow determination uh, it obviously contains no kind of quantification. Uh, this is a pure 
quality description, let's say, and the categorization of those descriptions. Uh, but it would help the reader on a, on a, on a first view um, uh, to rate uh, what he can expect uh, from the quality, uh, from the heat flow determination um, without looking into the details. And may I comment? Please. This, this looks a very, uh, very useful and a reasonable um, approach, and, and very much follows the ideas I would, I would uh, 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 suggest myself. A couple of comments. Con uh, it, uh, you are uh, automatically valuing continuous temperature logs better than single point measurements. However, you have to take into account that sometimes the temperature data comes from an industrial log that has been uh, logged for different purposes than just not only for temperature. Then uh, if there has been a temperature probe, it could be that the, uh, the logging speed was because of uh, available time very fast. And the time constant of the, uh, of the probe is not um, sufficiently short to give reliable temperature values. Therefore, the data is somehow biased. It can also be that the temperature sensor is, is actually inside the electronics of an, some other probe. And then this data is indicative of more of the electronic uh, operation of the electronics, but gives also some indication of the real temperatures. So this way, uh, it would be important to maybe somehow to add a parameter uh, to, to control that the continuous temperature log was done uh, with such uh, logging parameters that it really is uh, represented. That's one point uh, uh, which I, I think needs to be uh, taken into account. Uh, I totally and then one, one more point is related to, to lake measurements. The lake measurements have been debated quite uh, strongly in the heat flow commission. I, I remember uh, meetings where Jean-Claude Maréchal from Canada uh, was opposing very strongly of including any lake measurements in the uh, uh, heat flow database. He even uh, stood up and said that if you do that, I will take my data out of the, <laughs> the database or something. So. Uh, the lake measurements have a lot of um, uh, uh, complexities related to the uh, uh, equilibrium temperature uh, uh, gradient estimate. So they are far from anything simple. And I would suggest that the temperature gradient from a lake measurement should be uh, uh, given as uh, its own category somehow. But how good that is depends on, 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 on the case, of course, and how, how well well, uh, the problems have been uh, taken into account. But these two, the logging speed and the lake measurements. Yeah, um, yeah uh, thank you very much. I, I totally agree. Um, and I, I read your comment here a bit that we need a refinement of the classifications and temperature gradients yeah. and, or the methods um, for sure. And I think one can come up with much more sophisticated classification of, of this part where things like logging speed, for example, or shut in time could be considered as well, uh, that we could mm. uh, get a um, adopted, uh, let's say, classification here yeah. where those things are considered. And, and, and uh, if, you, if you don't take this um, uh, carefully, uh, you, you might find yourself in a situation that uh, the old data in the, so the data produced before say 1990 or so, and including the database, which are single point measurements here mostly, but usually very carefully calibrated instruments. And, and uh, the only poor thing is that the point interval is large. Yeah. And, and, and then uh, this data would look uh, nominally much less reliable than a slobby industrial log. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 I know this point. It's, yeah, this is totally, I agree. Um, 
when can we we can think about you know bht is not bht for example right you can have uncorrected bhts with very large errors and you could uh, have some that are probably calibrated somehow with much smaller errors and um, probably we should think about mechanism and um, how we could include those information on on logging speed and probably um, uh, shut in time for example um, into this scale right but um, probably this is something a, a detailed discussion we can put into the, a workshop on conductivity and temperature gradients um, because i think at the moment um, um, this is not a general matter of whether those scheme would work it's uh, then we are just we just would discuss on the technical details right okay ignacio you are raising the hands for a couple of minutes so um, uh, but you're muted still uh, sorry good morning uh, thank you sven uh, congratulations i think uh, really you you is is very it is impressive the the strategy i think is very very good and i was wondering if uh, you, you have two parameters here for estimation the, the quality uh, conductivity and and, and and temperature and i was wondering if you can add one more the number of formations so that this the site uh, or and maybe also the length of the the the, the, the well so it's more like uh, uh, the specificity of the of the site so the number of formation and do again uh, this uh, include this parameter so you have a number of um, uh, maybe uh, thermal conductivities in in the well and maybe and uh, as a parameter of quality maybe you can add also the number of formations and uh, maybe also the the length of the well could be interesting and as Imo said could be also interesting to have a, a estimation of the the accuracy of the probe or things like that because we have a, an old probe from the 80s that is uh, very high accuracy with very high accuracy but the the response time is very slow so we can to be practical if the well is depth we can only have a measurement every five or ten meters because take minutes several minutes to stabilize so it will, maybe we will have a very good uh, measurements but uh, with a large spacing. Re, uh, and normally many of the of the probes that they, they are using our, in our department for for water purposes, they have like a continuous measurements, but uh, the, the accuracy is not very good. So uh, our old probe has a, is a, like a, millikelvins precision and now probes are, are the normal probes for for uh, for logins are in the in the zero five or kelvins or something like that so these two two aspects the 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 instrument and the and the site characteristics only is suggesting if we can find a way to to include these parameters. Maybe you could add the the temperature resolution as a parameter, indeed, in the classification. So the number of temperature values related to the length again of the interval. Do you mean that with temperature resolution? No, I mean in, in, in uh, decrease Kelvin. So is it a reading? Uh, so the, the resolution is 0.01, 0.01 or 0.1 or, or 0.5 even. So the um, sometimes the uh, uh, 
the resolution of the industrial probes is not very good. And if you're using uh, uh, quartz fiber, uh, it gives you a lot of data, but you have to average that a lot to get uh, at least a nominal resolution, even close uh, uh, to 0.05. Okay. Um, I've noted this point. Uh, this sounds for me as well as the technical aspects of the, con is, the, yeah. the, the sure. temperature um, uh, axis here and um, probably the number of formations, uh, um, Ignacio means, and the length of the wells um, as well. So uh, we, have, uh, we have noted all three points and I think we should pick this up when we come in a, in a later workshop again to the technical aspects of the gradients. Um, yeah. Jeffrey, you raise your hand. Yes, I just want to add, I think uh, Ilmo also commented it, but for the probe uh, sensing measurements, the, this methodological scheme is probably not a very uh, adapted so. So we have to think it's well. It's, it's certainly for borehole measurements uh, uh, applicable, but for for probe sensing measurements, um, so where we well we never have continuous profiles in uh, offshore recordings, um, and our connectivity measurements are very often in in situ. So sometimes they are maybe on on course, but. Uh, so we probably have to think of a, of a, of a, of a different or, or adapted uh, scheme for probe measurements. Yeah, this seems true. <laughs> I'm a bit biased by my own experience, which is clearly not marine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. This focus very much on borehole data. Um, that's true. And um, probably you... Um, yeah, probably you can um, formulate ideas on how one could such a thing like a score-based methodological classification could be look like for marine uh, probe data. When? Let's see. Yes. Um, well, just <laughs> um, how shall I say? A request. Um, um, all these you present, especially the slides, uh, are excellent and useful and helpful. So I personally, but probably others also, would like to have your slides uh, to think about it. And uh, you could just um, send around um, a PDF or something of, of these slides uh, we are just discussing. Would that be possible? Yeah, sure. No problem. This, we can openly share this. Yeah. I know that this is a lot of information uh, um, instantaneously here. So um, um, I would share this afterwards, uh, probably together with some minutes, and you can recalculate or recapitulate on that. Yeah. Think Thanks. about this. Sure. Okay. Could the um, marine, marine heat flow data be uh, managed? Uh, in a as as a group of their own. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? So, so I mean, I mean, what what Jeffrey uh, pointed out that we're uh, looking at um, continental borehole situation here mostly. Yeah. But uh, but the marine data is is a really big share of the global heat flow data, and that uh, would uh, certainly need its own quality assessment. Uh, do you think this applies to the uh, to the first part, the uncertainty quantification as well. You have to think about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then let's consider for now this as, as more focused on the continental borehole data or well, the borehole data, even on marine aspects, but not the probe data here. Jeffrey, are you still raising your hand or is this a leftover? Probably a leftover. Okay. Then, um, sorry. Yes, let's see. Um, just another request. You mentioned before that you tried this scheme on one real field example. Could you 
Um, attach that too, please. Uh, yes. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Then the I would proceed toward the third step, and um, this is something where we uh, where our discussion heated a bit <laughs> because perturbation effects are really the crucial crucial thing here. You know? Imagine you could have uh, uh, you could have the uh, heat flow determination, which is from the methodological point of view, perfect. You have very high resolution temperature data. You have measured full the full borehole full of cores and uh, uh, applied saturated layers. So we could have a very high methodological accuracy here. And you have computed the uh, uh, the uncertainties, of course, based on the data given there. So uh, the first uh, the first two aspects here of the uncertainty and the methods could be rated very high, um, but you have done it in a field where you have intense convection, where you have paleoclimate overprint, probably a heat refraction with a granite beside. So um, which means the heat flow value determined obviously reflects very local conditions, but uh, has nothing to do, probably nothing to do with the terrestrial background heat flow. So the questions of perturbation effects here, this um, is uh, a very big issue. And um, yeah, we discussed how how one can target this. And um, there we came out with more or less uh, two approaches. One we would show you up here and one we could potentially discuss in, in future. But our first approach here is simply that within uh, a quality score um, we, we demonstrate here where you have compiled the uncertainty quality, quality and the methodological quality, we can report also whether such perturbation effects occur or not. Um, so we summarize here effects like sedimentation, erosion, topography, trends in climate impact, convection fluid flow, or heat refraction. Um, and our proposal would be that we simply add letters behind um, that can be in lowercase, uppercase, or an X, uh, which inform us whether in the, for the lower case, an effect is present, uh, but not corrected for. And in the upper case, whether an effect is present and it was corrected for. Or in the third case, an X, if an effect is not described and not present at all. And which with such a three or triplet categorization, you could immediately say whether effects are present at all and whether they are corrected for or whether they are not present. And um, the point with this system, this is only descriptive, but it would give us an immediately overview about the perturbation effects recognized by the authors. Uh, and it would uh, require, but it would require a small adaption of the present heat flow structure because of the present database structure because at the moment we just consider if an effect is corrected for or not. Uh, this is what we consider with the flex and with the yes, no categorization. Uh, and uh, this a bit is, uh, was a strategic uh, mistake or a learning curve for us uh, now that we actually should not only include the information in the flags whether an effect is uh, corrected for or not, but we also need to know whether effect is present. Um, however, one can one can uh, adjust uh, the heat flow flags and the database we have defined for those uh, uh, perturbation effects in a way that we make uh, instead of naming them yes and no, uh, one can modify it for a third version, which includes small and uppercase letters and the X values. So this would be just a small justification, but gives us more information uh, whether those effects are present at all. Um, this kind of notification um, obviously gives uh, the reader a very very quick overview whether perturbation effects are present and whether they're corrected. 
um, but it, it is not a scoring uh, or an evaluation whether the correction is correct or not, whether what is the magnitude of correction, um, whether um, the right the right correction was was selected or probably there's a better one or not. Uh, this would require a lot more information in the database to include this. So um, for now, we would suggest that we document the perturbation effects. Uh, um, but uh, at the moment, we do not have a very convincing idea to put this into an evaluation scheme uh, in another way than we suggested this for now. So, Ilmo. Thanks. Um, my comment is uh, related to the depth of measurement. Now, already knowing the depth of measurement, so it's a completely different issue if I report a heat flow data in southern Finland at the depth of 100 meters, or I report something from the same site at the depth of two kilometers. Of course, the, the raw uh, the heat flow data from two kilometers is probably much more representative uh, as, as a general heat flow value than the value from 100 meters. Could we add somehow the depth information here in this uh, scheme? Yeah. yeah, this was our discussion as well, and I would just jump a bit forward um, uh, to the second aspect here, um, because we discussed how, yeah, we discussed exactly this. Actually, all the, uh, most of those effects, sedimentation, erosion, climate, and topography, this is a matter of depth. Uh, um, mm. One could define a threshold probably at three kilometer depth uh, where almost in all regions of the world, we could be sure that sedimentation, erosion, climate, and topography does not take, uh, does not uh, have a very big effect anymore. But uh, obviously, um, um, one would need to have, very, well, with different geological settings, obviously, different kind of uh, depth uh, thresholds would apply. Uh, and uh, Ben and me, at least in the first place, we did not have a convincing answer for ourselves how to, to define such, uh, such thresholds. Uh, but it, this is, I think, exactly what you addressed here. Uh, um, that the depth obviously makes a big difference whether those effects are significant or not, depending on where we are in the world. Uh, then, of course, there are aspects like uh, fluid flow convection and heat refraction that requires local geological knowledge. Uh, um, this is something where we do not have an idea how we can address this from the data stored in the database so far. Uh, here, for the first one, obviously, one can find, uh, one can use the depth value, uh, but um, at least the depth value of the heat flow interval, um, and one can, can find a clever algorithm of thresholds that vary depending on region and uh, yeah, uh, probably geological setting, although I think this is challenging. But um, this obviously, I don't know if this is possible for fluid flow and heat refraction. And the final point here, the drilling perturbation. Um, this is uh, obviously something that, uh, um, yeah, is also a perturbing effect, um, which probably could be addressed with shut-in time and the total depth of the borehole, but we do not have record the total depth yet. Uh, we just have record the depth of the heat flow interval. So um, this is, yeah, there, there could be approaches to, to go for that. Um, um, yeah, but um, yeah, this, I think this is a matter on, of discussion on, on, on its own, right? Where one should really focus on um, and where we do not have a convincing proposal yet. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Sven, sorry to, to dominate the airspace all the time. A uh, quick question on fluid flow and heat refraction. Actually, these are factors which are just the properties of the nature. And if you're making a careful measurement of heat flow, uh, uh, it, it uh, very probably always has uh, some sort of an effect of fluid flow and heat refraction. They can be very tiny, 
but they can still be there. And uh, instead of seeing them as something that we should correct for, we could have simply a statement or a note in the data that uh, the authors think there are fluid flow effects and they think that there are heat refraction effects. And any further information requires local knowledge and modeling. So not, not to see them as, as, uh, as uh, something which is uh, we need to correct for, but just to recognize that there are these effects if uh, the authors think so. Yep, that clearly could be a way to treat it, yes. Sven, do you hear me? Yes, sure. Well, um, <laughs> just one question. Um, well, what you are proposing is, is, is a real uh, methodology to quantify um, uncertainties. Now, let's imagine a case uh, you want to make what is, what is really interesting, a heat flow map of this uh, area or region or whatever in question. Now, how to do this mapping? Uh, do you distribute then weights uh, corresponding to, to your classification or how to, how to do the mapping? Yeah. Um, yeah, the nice thing with such, such a scheme is that um, um, it would allow us um, to select the parameter, well, not the parameter ranges, but the quality ranges we would like to map, right? Uh, it would be easily to to define, okay, just map uh, uncertainties and uh, uh, methods with the highest impacts and with no with no perturbation effects present. Yeah? Because obviously you can select any kind of threshold uh, uh, for each of these three parts of the yeah. scoring and uh, then just select those data you want to see within the mapping. Yeah? So this is, uh, this is not only a, a quality score, it also would act or could act as a selector variable uh, for your mapping. So for example, if, if you want to have just, uh, um, um, you know, uh, methods uh, of, of, the, of the level four, which means you have pure temperature data and pure conductivity data as a selection criteria. Uh, obviously you, you easily can, uh, can read it out of those scores here, right? So yes, I don't know whether but, this answers this question. But, but, but uh, <laughs> so you certainly need some, some data density to, to map. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm okay. not sure whether I got the connection to the score yet. Um, mapping obviously requires data and some data density, uh, um, depending on the on the mapping and projection algorithm. Um, but this is this is not specifically addressed to the score, right? You just can use the score to, to probably reduce the amount of data and to just see select data. Uh, uh, well, it, it depends on the uh, available number of... Okay, okay, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, are there other points to address for this perturbation effects proposal? Is, is the idea Hi, simply ben. to is the idea to 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 um, to show up just the mm -hmm. the type of effect with with lower and upper cases that uh, whether it's corrected or not and with an X if the effect is not present convincing in the score does it give more information for you? Um, this... Hi, Sven. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Ignacio. Uh, I hello. Uh, also, I think also that it's a very, very good uh, solution. Okay, uh, pl please correct uh, in vertical, is you, you, you wrote correction, corrosion in, in, in the R. 
you see <laughs> erosion I, I know at one point about <laughs> about about, about, right. um, about f uh, fluid flow or water circulation yeah. i think is you you find the you found a very good solution for all this so maybe the this uh, naming can help to identify possible uh, like uh, uh, anomalies or things or thing like that. So maybe uh, the, there can be a, like a second level of the information. Imagine now we have a, a, a point a measurement where we have some the, the naming indicate we have some anomalies in fluid flow. So maybe can be like a second level information and to inform you what kind of 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 uh, water circulation if it's upwards downwards or is inside the the well so because with fluid flow uh, in uh, regarding groundwater is very usually is easy to identify in the in the shape of the of the curve of the of the thermometry the heat reflection reflection may be not because it's a longer wavelength so but in, in many cases you can see the the therm thermometry and identify what kind of of water circulation is affecting the the measurements so and uh, so finally, yes, I think it's a very good solution and maybe uh, could be another level provided for, for the, for, for the uh, group that uh, took this measurement, like a, a long, for, for example, you can have a, an, an area where you have a big uh, or important uh, groundwater perturbation. A lot of measurements and in Spain came hot springs because it's, a, it's an anomaly uh, of measurement, but this is not representative of the, of the heat flow. So if we can have this information and maybe as uh, uh, Rebac said, maybe for this area, we can, uh, when we will map identify this area well, uh, like an anomaly when we are mapping. So I think it's a good idea finally, and, uh, uh, and maybe we can have a second level information for, for being more precise in the kind of uh, perturbation that we have. Yeah, I, I, I understand this idea. At the moment, the database structure does not re gives not the opportunity within with an individual field to define whether we have up, upflow or downflow or what kind of, of flow circulation there. Um, so currently, this is more um, a matter for the common field, for example. Uh, but if you think this is uh, of such an importance, um, I think we should discuss later whether the structure should be uh, adopted to that, uh, whether there must be a new field defined. Because at the moment, the, the database does not cover uh, in a regular way this information of up and down flow. Uh, it just gives you the information whether you have a flow effect or not present. Or well, no, whether the flow effect is corrected for or not. Yes. Okay. So, but uh, <clears throat> it's, it's, I agree. It's only some suggestion, and uh, it's very difficult. We cannot. I think I, I don't know how to correct uh, fluid flow effects. Okay. Good more. Um. I was thinking of uh, two cases. Uh, first, uh, if you look at the Canadian prairies, uh, the heat flow data there, uh, there's a well-known effect of uh, deep uh, groundwater circulation from the Rocky Mountains 
that then uh, carries the water in an aquifer beneath the shales, the, the uh, heat flow values, uh, heat flows measured in the shale are conductive as such, but their overall values are affected by the heat transfer by the fluid flow. And, and uh, uh, then the heat flow data uh, can be of very high quality, but nevertheless, there is a uh, uh, flow effect. But there should be just simply a note that uh, these and these authors think that there is a effect. Another example could be the Rheingraben. If you go to the salts area and, and, and look from the uh, heat flow data from the um, uh, uh, geothermal exploration wells drilled there, you will have high uh, uh, gradients uh, in a conductive lid layers, but then you have low uh, gradients in, in layers where the convection is active. And once again, um, uh, uh, the, the, the measurements can be of high quality and well controlled, but then uh, a direct uh, estimation of giving a correction for those uh, 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 technically uh, determined heat flow values may not be reasonable at the level of the database. So there's a certain uh, boundary where the responsibility of the uh, quality of the data is, is transferred to the user of the database. So the user must be aware of effects which uh, may play a role. And if there is a note that be careful, we have fluid flow effects uh, reported in this area or something like that. So um, would, okay. On the one hand side, we can give this note obviously with, with uh, such a scheme. Uh, as a general note, but do you think about more details that uh, this should be included in the common field or should we have an extra field of explanation for, for such effects? Um, um, what would be the proposal here? Because I understand you in a way that, um, you know, the, what we have proposed obviously would give such information, for example, um, we would have here a, a small what uh, V, for example. We have we know that such an effect is is in place. Uh, uh, probably it's not corrected. That's okay. We just consider it, the effect is in present. Or would you propose that we need to ha have a more elaborated, more detailed uh, option of explanation? Uh, yeah, it is what I want to say. That maybe we should have for every by every category at the comment uh, or a note field where eventually, for example, also in the case that Ignacio, Ignacio was saying, we could just say, okay, there is upward or downward fluid flow or the reviewer thinks that there is some, I don't know, sedimentation effect uh, and maybe the cause could be something. So at one, one note field, for every of for every one of the category, where eventually some other additional information about the um, uh, if this effect is described a little bit in the in the manuscript, it can be summarized in this note, and uh, uh, yeah. And, and to include this, or maybe a comment to this, where, where we describe why we decided to um, give one grade, uh, I don't know, instead of the other, for example. Ben? Um, yes, uh, one, one comment, uh, because just Ilmo raised it, and I think that's a, a, a really good point. I uh, realized by myself as well uh, that the, the overall goal to provide everyone who wants to use heat flow data uh, the, uh, the best uh, um, judged uh, data based on what we have in the global heat flow database is, is something we, so now we cannot 
achieve. So I think we must train the users of the database that there are, even if we have everywhere uh, uh, X there in these perturbation effects, that it might be uh, affected, but it was not recognized by anyone using it. But what I want to uh, uh, highlight is that we want to use the data as well uh, um, sharing or using other data so that we may plot this uh, the values against uh, data we have from from some other surveys and stuff like this and then we need a kind of um, versioning of the database so it might be that we realize by working with the data that we realize okay this is uh, actually a, a value uh, reported with no effects but we clearly can see that it is not within the same range of other data that it is related to some fluid uh, uh, convection stuff something like this and then somebody may judge okay we have to adapt the rating and say okay we have here value with uh, fluid flow involved and then it would be nice that we can of course change this x to an v and then we had a versioning that uh, an author, some person or some user of the database judged that this is affected and can give some evidence by uh, maybe uh, or some, some hints based on, on what he know from, from literature or from his own study and stuff like this. And I think this is the way we cannot, uh, 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 so, so we cannot uh, overrule the, the uh, decisions of the authors for all entries in the database. So we have, uh, we stay to this and this is yeah, where I think this is why we, Sven and I end up with this kind of idea to give some what we know already. And it, of course, uh, it might change over time. I was muted. Sorry, Ilmo, you wanted to comment on that. Yes, uh, one more thing that uh, uh, is related to the technical quality of the log and flow is the uh, the flow in the borehole. So, um, as I've been working mostly in, in in crystalline rock environments, it's quite common that we have fractures that are hydraulically active here and there, and they create a flow along the borehole. That complicates the interpretation of the log. So, uh, in, in, in these notes about the uh, 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 convective uh, flow uh, disturbances, there could be a note that uh, uh, the heat flow interval is disturbed by flow in the hole, or it's uh, probably disturbed by flow in the formation. Now, there's a different situation if you're in, in, in porous rocks, in sedimentary environments, then it could be a bit difficult sometimes to say from the log that uh, it's it's somehow disturbed without uh, some more careful modeling. But th this sort of a things of uh, flow in the borehole are quite easy to to interpret and 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 uh, detect actually from the logs. There are very nice classical papers by by uh, uh, Lewis and and uh, Chesop and, and Ruri from the 80s already about these flow effects in the borehole. I, I wonder whether it would make sense summarizing the past five minutes whether we we change a bit the guidelines and ask the user directly that they if they take that there are flow present they also include a comment in the comment field obviously or a note in the comment field yeah. about the nature of this flow yeah. and um Obviously, we cannot force to do so, but um, we can directly point towards the importance that yes. this information should be explained in the comment field. Would that be uh, yeah, sufficient? Okay. Okay, yeah, then uh, sorry, uh, there was a uh, Corrosion mentioned here before it obviously meant erosion. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know <laughs> what happened. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, so I just would like to jump on the next slide here because there is um, just to sum this up. 
Yeah. Obviously, it's such a quality score, which is then combined of uh, an information about uncertainty and information about the methods and an information about perturbation effects here um, could be read in such a way. Uh, uh, the first part obviously could include uh, the four different uh, categorization of uncertainty and an U UX, which means that uncertainty could not be quantified. Uh, uh, the second part would include the different kind of methodological categorizations and an MX, which means methods could not be uh, evaluated because of missing data. And the third part we recently discussed, uh, containing small and large letters for the questions whether an effect is present uh, or an effect is present and corrected for, or the effect is not present at all. Uh, um, if, if you follow this idea, we would be forced to, to change the structure of the database because the, the fields we use so far are the, are the flag fields, which are connected to a yes and no scheme at the moment. And we need to include a third option so that this would require a small uh, adoption of the current structure, but then would offer us a possibility to store both information uh, that the author see an effect or not, and they correct it for it or not. The, uh, the questions we need, I think, to answer as well as how we transmit those information, because our proposal would, would be that those quality scheme is applied on the child level. Yeah. And then is the questions, what are you doing uh, uh, on the parent level? Because we want to have this information for the overall location and you could have different uh, heat flow intervals, for example, that are merged to a, uh, to a um, site heat flow value right and our proposal here would be that if you have different for example heat flow determination intervals that are uh, average to an overall value that uh, we always include the poorest information for each of this aspect uh, accumulated to a parent value yeah? for example if you have for example four different child elements with different determination interval and depth um, that, that are uh, where different qualities are assigned uh, for each category, the, the poorest quality will be inherited to the parent element. Uh, that would be our proposal, um, but one can treat this, of course, uh, in a more optimistic way or a different way. But this is something we need to think about, uh, how the data from the child's, if they are look different, if different methods are applied or corrections are applied, for example, how this is inherited to the parent element. Uh, I think this is just a, a small issue. It's not the most important one, but this is where we need to, to have an agreement finally, if we want to follow, want to follow the general proposal of this quality score at all, right? And, um, yeah, I think um, that that are all slides we have for such a proposal. Yeah. But um, yeah, that means we could open up the general discussion whether this this uh, way of uh, uh, targeting uncertainty quantification, method quality, and perturbation effects, and combining it in in one visible score is reliable uh, and um, if you want to follow this in general or if you have different ideas on that. And I think Jeffrey, he raised the hand for two minutes, so I'm silent now. Well, just, just a small comment on the perturbation effect because you have the X which says there is uh, no effect, but there is no really tech to say that the effect was not recognized, for example. In some cases, I think it, we, we can't say that there is an effect or there is not an effect. So I'm not sure if, if it's, if seeing X um, is always uh, meaning that it's not present. So. so you would propose that we do not say it's is not present, uh, it's not recognized. Maybe both of them effect not present or not recognized, maybe.
Okay. It, um, it could be effect not present or not recognized. Yes, I think that's more yeah. convenient. So that would be better, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, okay. More more comments on that. More comments on the general idea of this um, the scheme so far, or on some technical, or probably more general comments first, because I would propose that the question of how um, um, we design technical details, we should then move into the detail uh, or thematic workshops of uh, that follow up here. Probably I think we should first talk about whether this is a, a reliable proposal and we want to follow up this or not. Ben. Yeah, just, just one remark, because if we end up with a score like this and we have this uh, different uh, scores combined in one code, let's say, then of course we can uh, easily provide for the community some description where we think what are the most or most reliable categories, or if we say, okay, so, so to give some, some handlines or some, some guidelines for using the data, because uh, so it's not an, not an easy uh, code saying, okay, I know this is the best value. It's not category A. So there's not given just one number. So I think we need uh, um, to, to give some, uh, need to give some, some help for understanding this code and to describe it. And I think this is a, also a good chance to um, get more, more involved in, in why heat flow is uh, how it is. <laughs> so I think that it's even a, a, a better than, than just uh, say, okay, what might be changed, but we can uh, end up with uh, some categories uh, guiding the user how he could um, pick up the, the best data or more likely the best data, something like this. So just one general comment. Um, I think to add on this, um, probably um, the the to assign this code. This is should I, I, this is not what Ben said, but I want to make this remark. This code could be applied automatically based on the information of the database. So the user is not in charge to select how how good is the data and how is it rated, eh? because this will be done automatically based on the information of the database. Um, so I don't want to put the responsibility to to select the kind of uh, quality code to the user. Yeah? Um, it's simply, you know, this can be recalculated every time when the database is updated or whenever huh? automatically. Um, yeah, but Ilmo, you have a comment. I agree with Ben that um, it would be important to provide guidelines for the users of the database. And, and uh, uh, I, I can figure out kind of a uh, um, uh, hands-on um, guidelines in a way that uh, if you're interested in paleoclimatic interpretations of heat flow data, look, uh, uh, make a search using these and these parameters. And if you're interested in uh, pure uh, conductive heat flow for crustal uh, and lithospheric purposes, use these and these parameters for uh, quality criteria. And if you're interested in uh, heat flow uh, and uh, groundwater flow uh, uh, effects together, please use these and these parameters. So this way the, it, it would be would make sense to, to, to uh, for, for, for the users to, to uh, of course, how they use the data is their responsibility, but it would be uh, uh, would, would uh, provide the basic uh, guidance on, on what are the most important uh, effects in the uh, uh, in terms of the quality criteria in the in the data sets and all these uh, parameters that we classify as kind of a poor quality factors they are not necessarily poor uh, problems for people uh, for instance working with groundwater flow effects they would be looking for this kind of a data 
and well, we can pick up this idea uh, instantaneously in you know we we start with the uh, with the development of the uh, of the new um, database online system in may so with a th within a three year project and uh, one can even provide some some kind of uh, pre selection uh, um, process in, on, on such a website where we said, okay, are you looking for polyclimate or, or groundwater related things and give some pre, uh, pre parameter selection uh, um, to the user in hand that he can just select, okay, I'm looking for polyclimate. And then we have some um, uh, changed options, for example, um, to make it easy. Yeah, um, um, to the user to, to find data required uh, for his purpose. Uh, but I think the important thing is that we consider that users are looking for different, uh, that, that users have different scientific questions uh, and they're looking for heat flow for different purposes, uh, uh, even for purposes that are not uh, geo-scientific uh, related. Uh, uh, we have recently learned that biologists are quite interested on, in temperature gradients and in, 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 in Antarctica. So for that reason, they are interested in heat flow to understand microbiological uh, living in very shallow ice regions, for example, right? Um, so there's obviously a community interested in such as thermal data that are not geoscientific related. And I think we could give some sun, some hand-on experience uh, and should guide them through how to use such a data and get the most out of it. Yeah. Uh, Argo, you had been the first, I think. Yeah, well, the scheme, evaluation scheme of data is sounds, sounds very reasonable uh, and, and at least a good starting point. Uh, what has to be done is evaluation the treasured values. Uh, what is what is good and what is not uh, for, for the rating point of view. Uh, when I think of Estonian data, we we have a stable platform area with sedimentary rocks, uh, thick enough, well controlled. Uh, um, with a reasonably controlled uh, thermal conductivity that can be um, taken from one borehole and, and uh, um, applied to another. But when we come to heat flow determinations, uh, I should report that there is non-thermal conductivity measurements in, in one borehole, for example. Uh, what is the score for such borehole? Uh, even though I, I have a nice control on, on thermal conductivity, there are still no values. So, uh, well, we, we have to test uh, what scores are, are given for that kind of boreholes or, or well, different stuff. Uh, also, uh, uh, what is a, a single measurement? How, what, is a, what is needed uh, um, uh, temperature measurement spacing to be continuous log? Is it, uh, well, sub-meter, sub-decimeter? Uh, or, well, sometimes uh, um, uh, long spacing doesn't mean uh, bad resolution. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I totally agree. Uh, I have seen, for example, data from, from Denmark with uh, almost two kilometer uh, uh, thick uh, chalk sections that are quite homogeneous, uh, which probably is quite similar to, or which addresses directly these questions uh, that sometimes large spacing uh, is not a problem to find reliable values, right? Um, yeah, we should note this idea or these, th uh, these thoughts and uh, addresses when we come back to uh, uh, talk about conductivities or temperatures in terms or in the light of, of this proposal. Yeah. Um. Thank you, yeah. um, just commenting what Argos uh, said about using estimated values. Now, in the in the history of heat flow uh, studies, uh, the the historical benchmark was the heat flow uh, data reported by Benfield in England, 1939. And it was the benchmark because he reported heat flow 
so that uh, the temperature gradient was, was measured in the same borehole where he measured also the thermal conductivities. Now, if you are using uh, uh, estimates from other boreholes, then the heat flow data is not measured. It, it's an estima estimated value. And that should, should be just a box to, to check that if, if it's not so measured, so it's an estimate. Then once again, it's on the responsibility of the author for this equality of the estimate. This is the, how I see it from the data uh, base uh, point of view. You know, um, keep in mind that in the current database, we already have the information included, whether we have a measured value or uh, estimated value from probably mineralogical information or an estimated value from well log interpretation. So this information actually is already included uh, and we should discuss in the next conductivity workshop whether this information should be included in the methodological evaluation uh, for conductivity. So, okay, I made this made this comment here. Um, well, actually, Massimi, you raised your hands. I have I've seen this, but uh, now it's, it's down again. Okay, okay. Uh, so I, I would like to reprise the, the, the previous comment by Ilmo about uh, the different kind of data that are today included in, in the database. There are heat flow values heat flow data uh, that uh, are purely conductive and they could represent the lithosphere heat flow. There are heat flow data that are perturbed by convection, advection, and uh, uh, okay, you can't use them, for example, for inferring the deep temperatures uh, and the uh, thermal structure of a lithosphere and so on. But uh, uh, the, the comments by him led me to think that we, we could also rethink to the global heat flow database. I mean, uh, at present, the global heat flow database includes data of uh, uh, not only of different quality, but different kind of information. So maybe that in future, we have to rethink the database and divide the database in subsets of a database, for example, a database specific of heat flow values uh, that contains uh, advection and uh, convection perturbation, because people who is looking for uh, uh, geothermal resources, for example, would be more, much more interested in such kind of, of, of data uh, rather than in pure conductive heat flows. And uh, again, another subset of the global heat flow database uh, where only pure conductive uh, heat flow values are included in order to provide people who is directed in uh, lithosphere modeling, for example, uh, to, to have a, a reliable database. So, okay, it's, it's not an idea for now, but I, 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 I was thinking about, uh, for example, people of, of the International Lithosphere uh, Program. In that case, uh, uh, heat flow data perturbed by affection are not so, so important and so interesting for, for, for them. But uh, they especially lo are looking, especially looking uh, at uh, pure conductive heat flow. So maybe that in future, uh, uh, we, uh, we we have to address this 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 uh, this, this issue and, and to to uh, to have a for example a, a general global heat flow database containing every any kind of information, but also a subset of uh, the global heat flow database con containing specific information to provide people interested in specific problem to, to use that, that special uh, databases. My comment on that would be that um, actually the, that does not need a specific subset databases because you can simply make such a selection based on the flags we already defined. Because um, if, if you use such a flag, uh, if the flags are filled with 
there is an advective effect present or not, or recognized or not, you simply can create such such subsets of data you are looking for already. Um, yeah, I think um, the the I think the if if the idea of the score um, finds your general interest, I think we need to discuss that we need to adopt the structure slightly uh, because we have to redefine those flag fields uh, a bit that allows us to, to store the information required. Huh? Because at the moment, those fields are defined as a yes and no field, um, um, which um, is not totally convincing. So we need to be, adopt the definition of the field a bit uh, that we can uh, store the small and the large letter, the, the lowercase and the uppercase uh, letters here and the X. And um, so at a certain point, if we want to follow those, uh, those strategy for the perturbation effects, we need to um, write a comment on the, on the database structure and refine the definitions of, of those four fields uh, um, that would be required in this term. Emo. You are muted. Sorry. Sorry, now, now, now you hear me. Uh, I, I would rec recommend a kind of an overall, overall division of the database, for instance, in a way that we have the continental heat flow data from boreholes. Then we have the continental heat flow data from lake measurements. And we would have then a big uh, part, which is the marine heat. And, and all these uh, actually would require a, a, a quality discussion with the uh, specialists who work with uh, these fields. I think most of us here are, are working with uh, continental boreholes. But, but the marine uh, heat flow data has its own problems and, and old, uh, old, uh, quality issues that may be difficult to fit into this scheme. But this scheme can be modified, certainly, uh, to, to, and to adapt that for the marine or the lake situations. And there are not only shallow lakes, but there are uh, temperature data measured also in, in quite uh, deep uh, lake boreholes, like, uh, like the boreholes that uh, ICDP has drilled for paleoclimatic purposes. They, they can all, also can, uh, produce the modern heat flow data and very deep boreholes there. I mean, several hundred meters. So division of the database uh, to different types of uh, broad classes of data would be my idea. Okay, uh, other comments on that idea? I can maybe give a small, com small comment, so it's, it's Jeffrey. Um, for the, the, the marine probe measurements, well, on first sight, I think probably we can use the same uh, scheme for, uh, for perturbation effects. We should simply uh, probably call the transient climate one for the, for the probe measurements, bottom water temperature variation effects. So, because we, we don't really have the, 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 the climate effect, but we often have the, the problem of bottom water temperature variations. So it can probably in the same, fall in the same, same case. So well, it's the first, first small uh, reply to the comment of, uh, of Emo. But for instance, in the marine data, it's quite important to take into account the, of course, the age of the lithosphere of the observation site and the thickness and extent of uh, sedimentary cover. Because this is the classical problem in, in marine heat flow is that the, yes, the heat flow measurement uh, uh, looks technically all right. It's a kind of a conductive data, conductive measurement that uh, a lot of the total heat transfer occurs around the sediment covered uh, part of the site in outcrops of uh, permeable basalt. 
So the the, the things are a bit different there than we have them uh, in the on the continent. And 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 I would I would invite warmly uh, marine heatful people to discuss these uh, problems. They they have a very pretty good insight on on, on these issues already. Um, could it make sense that we um, that we create subsequent workshops um, to refine this for the, the borehole scheme? And if when we have finished this, that we have a specific workshop to adopt the overall scheme for marine environments, that we separate those discussions a bit, uh, that we get clear. With, with the with the borehole data set here or with the with the borehole scheme and um, refine it as as much as possible and adopt it that we get those uh, points raised in the discussion today into this scheme uh, and um, when we when we have the feeling that we we addressed all those points and that we have a good solution uh, in this framework then we have an extra workshop and focusing on the marine aspects uh, and that we can pick up all the learning curve from the previous workshops and put this into the marine aspects. Uh, would, would that be a proposal <laughs> that we yeah, have follow up workshops now on, on conductivity and temperature in particular yeah, um, to, to think about how to uh, probably adopt the proposed scheme, for example, for the uh, for the methodological rating. And when this is done, uh, then we have an extra marine workshop with the particular marine experts. So that would be then my proposal. And um, I think um, given the time, <laughs> um, this would be also my summary here um, that um, we, send around a doodle link to have a new workshop. Uh, again, I think on we should start with the conductivity uh, in the light of the proposed scheme. And then um, um, probably, I don't know what's a good time. We have uh, some probably in four weeks, mid of March or so, uh, um, that we have one workshop each month uh, on conductivity, temperature, and the overall heat flow. and. This would give us, I think, sufficient time until uh, mid of June and uh, the Chermak meeting, which is more or less uh, we previously defined as uh, as time goal to to finish the work on the overall scheme. Uh, but, um, yeah, so my proposal now is um, we will write the minutes for this current workshop. Um, we will send around a new doodle poll to find a new date somewhere mid of March. I don't know whether this is a good good time uh, time slot uh, somehow to each of us. Uh, I don't know whether there are holidays or so. Um, if this is the case, please let me know that we can avoid some dates. Uh, and then we meet with a new workshop to discuss specifically on conductivity in terms of, of the uh, method approach here. Yeah. Sven. Ignacio. Hello. So, sorry, uh, one last thing. Think, uh, I was thinking if we can maybe add a link to, to, to the thermometer, to the graph. I put some examples in the, in the chat only as an idea. Okay, I, I put two images, one of uh, uh, general perturbations in, in boreholes, in the synthetic one, and the real measurements in boreholes with uh, perturbation or without. So maybe uh, could be possible to add a, a link in to a database where all the, the available graphs, uh, thermometries are, are there, and maybe it's an idea, okay? Yeah. I've, in the meantime, I've heard the general idea of linking primary data very often. So um, I think this is something we really should think about that we can add additional data to each data set. Uh, um, and in the past workshop and in the workshop before that, um, uh, the question was raised whether one can add 
the primary data of the temperature logs, for example, one can add some cross section, whatever. I think um, it might be good uh, to create the possibility in an online system uh, which accesses a database that allows to, to attach such data uh, for the evaluation of the heat flow value itself. Um, it's not the option for that is not included in the in the database structure defined so far but easily could be included that uh, and i think um, many people uh, have the demand for that uh, raised and um, so i think we should make this possible somehow okay um so if um if you agree with the general um uh, procedure, then I just have two points. Um, first, um, the deadline for the submission of heat flow data for the 2022 uh, global heat flow database update is uh, in mid of May. So we have three months left uh, to revise heat flow data and put it into the new database update. Uh, this is just a general reminder to those of you who are involved in the data assessment. Um, second, next week, uh, we have this 24-hour uh, workshop um, to give uh, support to each of you and the community to get into this uh, assessment of the database um, where we like to share all the uh, experience we gained so far with the reassessment project. Uh, so we are very much invited to join us next week uh, and to put all your questions on the table uh, how to deal with transforming data from the publications into the new database structure and um, yeah i think uh, for now i would be glad if everyone can activate the camera so i would like to make one screenshot for the minutes where everyone is smiling <laughs> or whatever but um uh yeah, to visualize that we are still a lot of people around here. Um, that would be great. Perfect. Rob is there. Oh, again. Okay, so I will do a picture in five, four, three, two, one smiling <laughs> perfect thank you very much uh this was a very nice uh, uh discussion today um i hope this uh um yeah helps us on our way to to proceed and to develop something that works for us and for the community and um if no one of you has uh, any point left uh, yeah i would be glad to see you in four weeks uh somehow for now um, we will send around the minutes probably toward the end of this week or next week. And uh, with that attached also uh, a copy of the slides and uh, uh, a doodle link for the new date. And um, thank you very much for your time, uh, for joining us, all your support. Uh, bye, see you next time. All right, thank you. See you. Bye-bye to everybody.